In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. I'd like to thank everyone for coming back and this uh, abundant full number of, of people. Um, I'd like to thank everyone because, as you guys remember, does anyone remember what series we're covering right now? Acts, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I try to make it as simple as possible this time. But um, there was a reason that we went about this, this book of Acts, and it was something that was trailing off the Apostles' Fast, where when we were talking, we said, you know, if we look at the book of Acts, there was something that was so great that was happening at the early church in that time. And it was the formation of the church. You know, it kicked start like all Christianity at a rapid rate. Just the amazing things that were happening during that time to cause Christianity not just to spread throughout that region, but ultimately into the whole world. Clearly, they were doing something right. So if we wanted to go back and we wanted to learn a few things, you know, because I think as a church, we want to say that we want to do some things right, too. And if we looked at some of the characteristics and the growth patterns that were in the early church and the way that they were doing that, we said, well, you know what? I want to be like that. So we wanted to look at that. We want to look at these stories because there are some stories we want to look at. We would say, I want to imitate that. You know, there was something and this is one of the major reasons of success in the early church because the way that they did things. And there's also a couple stories in there say, well, you know what? I'm going to learn from that. Like I know a couple years ago we talked about Ananias and Sapphira and the fact that they lied to the Holy Spirit and they were holding back and, and they died. It cost them a very, very expensive price. Um, so we really liked this book of Acts. It's something that we really as a church we want to learn from. But I have to be honest. I feel a little guilty about this week because I feel like I took one of the best stories. And it was, it was even such one of the good stories. I didn't even tell Mark I was talking about it because I was worried that he was going to object to it. <laughs> to say that he wanted it. Um, so I just kind of ran with it because I, I feel like this story is huge and it's something that, you know, I feel that like, I don't know if we are experiencing enough of it in our churches these days, you know, and I have a deep longing to see this in our churches these days, because if we are not seeing this aspect, this type of story, we should be concerned as a church because it's something that we see throughout the whole entire Bible. It's a reoccurring theme. It's something that's really, really important. And ultimately, if we ever plan on growing the church, we need to have this in it. Matter of fact, I personally believe that this is what God is all about. Luke 15 is an entire chapter in the Bible that is focused on this extremely important message. Now, brownie points and a gold star for anyone who can tell me what Luke 15 is about. There's three stories in it. You got the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. In each of these stories, something was lost. In that same story, something was found. Everything changed. And at the end of every single one of the stories, there was rejoicing. There was rejoicing. And I think that this is something that we need to embrace in our church, but even more than we need to embrace, I think this, in my opinion, this is something we should expect in our churches. We are here to evangelize to a lost world. It's one of our purposes. It's one of our big purposes. Now, we need to be concerned with the lost inside of the church, but we also need to be concerned with the lost outside of the church as well. That should be one of our primary drivers. And isn't that what God himself came down to be concerned with? You know, you look at Luke 1911. It says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So keep in mind, it's not like Christ basically came down. He says, you know what, we, you know, I know I have a lot of faithful Jews here, you know, so I really want to open up this new covenant to the faithful Jews, you know, which he was here for. But what else was he here for? He was here because he wanted to seek and to save that which was lost. And I think that we have probably one of the clearest examples in this in the book of Acts. Can anyone tell me the huge story that happened in Acts 9? The conversion of Saul to St. Paul. Because this is a big deal story. You know, because I think like this one thing that happened just in Acts 9, you know, it catapulted so many other things that happened. First of all, you realize that Acts 9 forever changed the rest of the book of Acts. Like the book of Acts would look very, very different if it wasn't for St. Paul. You know, then you look at it, you take it a step further. You say, okay, well, the evangelism that happened in the early church, the way that it spread throughout the region, all of his missionary trips, none of that would have happened 
if it wasn't for the conversion of Saul. You know, to really think about it, this Bible that, that I am holding, the Bible that we all have, would look extremely different if it wasn't for the conversion of Saul. You know, this is one of the biggest events in, in my personal opinion. This is huge. And I thank God because, you know what, as big as that event was, as much as it forever changed the future to come, you know, I'm thankful for a God that took the time to show up in that story, to show up to someone like Saul. Guaranteed that was unexpected. No one saw that coming. And I thank God that he showed up there. I thank God that he still shows up. I thank God that he seeks the lost, that he gets in their way, that he does miraculous things just to get our attention. The same way he does in this story. And I'd love to say that Acts 9 on the road to Damascus was the first time that St. Paul or Saul at that time and Christ had a run-in together. But I don't believe that's the case. I don't. And we'll, and we'll share a couple of reasons why. You know, because God's plan for us is set way before he shows up on stage. His plans way before we're ever knowledge, like we have knowledge of it, far before we ever experience it. And, and I think we see it clearly in St. Paul's life. I think we also see it clearly in our own life. We always got to remember Jeremiah 29, 11, the golden verse that we quote all the time. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you a hope and a future. So I think a lot of times we'll look at a story and we just kind of pick up there. But I'm telling you, you know, in this story, in my life, in your life, I know before we all had our little, you know, on the road to Damascus meeting with God, that he wrestled with our hearts far before that. You know, because when I think of what God did on that road, I take, you take it back to the beginning of eternity and God already know, knew that St. Paul was coming. He had knew how he was going to be born, the resume he was going to give him, you know, the way that he was going to basically prepare him to be the perfect tool in his hand. What we see here is just when it all comes together. So obviously, the conversion of Saul was a big deal. And I wonder in our churches today, if we are light on conversions. If we don't have the number of conversions that God's looking down and basically saying, you know, this is what I expect from the church. You know, do we have people turning from their life that's currently chasing God knows what, whether it be the world, its possessions, the lust of the flesh, whatever it is. Do we have people in our churches that are chasing those things and they have interaction with God and it changes the trajectory of their life? You know, and they, they start deciding that none of that is worth it and I need to live a holy, consecrated, and sanctified life for God. My purpose has changed. My desires have changed. Everything's changed. Because I wonder if God looks down at us. He says, you know what? That's what I plant this church for. The reason you guys are there is I want you to get people to turn from their sin, to repent, and to follow me wholeheartedly. Because a healthy church involves a cycle. We bring them in. We build them up and we send them back out, right? To go out and, and to preach and to evangelize and to, and, and to draw more people back in as well. And I wonder how are we doing at that? I believe we typically, do we bring them in? Sorry, guys. Typically, I think we birth them in, okay? Because <laughs> this church has grown organically, you know, historically speaking, you know? So we birth them in. We do everything in our power to keep them here, you know, to not lose them. You know, and if they stray, we, we do everything in our power to bring them back, and then we die. And I fear that that could be a cycle that, that, that is easy to fall into. But I think that we're missing something big, because that's not God's plan for the church. You know, oh, I guess I skipped that one. Okay, James 5.20, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I wonder if we looked at it this way, or you know what, how about Luke 17.5? I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And I wonder if we took that verse to heart and we knew that this is really what delighted the heart of God and, you know, just the heavens rejoice for it. Would we be more mindful of that? Would we be chasing these people down? Would we have a more proactive effort to go out there and to get to people who are living far from God? 
you know. And then I sit there and I, and, and I read that, that verse and I wonder, <clears throat> what do you think heaven looked like at the time of Saul's conversion? You know, like, I know that there is more, more joy in heaven over one sinner, but Saul, <laughs> Saul was like, he might have been worth 99 sinners for everything that he was doing to the church. It was a big deal. And I believe that no one could have been as an effective example to what God can do with a person better than Saul. You know, you see, Saul had a lot of baggage. He wasn't a no-name. You know, when he showed up, he showed up with a reputation. And he didn't just show up in Acts 9. He showed up a couple, you know, chapters earlier. He's mentioned in 7. But he's not mentioned in the way that you want to be mentioned in the Bible. You know, this guy, he was doing horrible things. You know, in Acts 7, you know, and this was almost a story that I did, but I jumped, uh, I jumped forward in fear that Mark would take Acts 9. But um, so in Acts 7, they stone Stephen, the first martyr. And they lay all the feet down at the feet of Saul, meaning that they're, they're kind of like he was in charge of that. He got the glory for that. He was the one that was responsible for killing the, the, who they thought was a heretic at the time, a blasphemer at the time, um, St. Stephen. And in, in Acts 8, it talks about how Saul was insistent on persecuting the church. And you read the stories of him, of him before his conversion, and he was just so full of hatred and anger towards Christians. And he only had one job, and it was that we want to destroy him. We want to get rid of all the Christians. We've got to stomp them out. And that was his number one goal. Acts 8.3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. I was reading a commentary on this, and they said it's ironic that he brought up the women because usually you don't go after the women. Women and children are safe. You know, but this guy was so full of just hatred that nothing was off guards for him. And this is what I mean, but I don't believe this was Saul's first interaction with Christ. It couldn't have been. There's something important I want to point out about Saul. Saul was very well-intentioned. You know, if you read his resume, which he quotes about himself, you know, says that he loved the law. He was all about the law. He studied the law. He obeyed the law. He lived the law. And he says, concerning the law, I was blameless. Blameless. But he persecuted the church. It's what he did. That was his full-time job. It was his primary gig. So when you want to start talking about someone who was lost, in my opinion, St. Paul was lost. He was gone. And I wonder if in our churches we have people who might look a little bit like Saul. Who on the outside, you know, or actually even on the inside, they're well-intentioned. You know, and they think what they're doing is right. And they think that everything's justifiable. And they think that they might even doing it, be doing it for a greater cause. But it's just misdirected. You know, and I wonder if we search our hearts, not our actions. Because sometimes our actions are okay. You know, we appear well. People might come and lay down their clothes at our feet by saying that, you know what? You're, I love what you're doing at church. And you're doing great. And you're doing that. You're a godly man. You're a godly woman. You know, blah, 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 blah. But I wonder... If sometimes on the inside, we could be lost too. We could be a little bit misdirected. And I'll be honest, there's no shortage of types of lost. You know, I think that we have some people who might resemble Saw, who look great on the outside, but they're horrible on the inside. I think that there's people that are just, they're lost on the outside and they're lost on the inside. But the good news is, is that God doesn't give up on any of them. On any single one, if, if, if you're lost inside, outside, in between, whatever, then you're, per, you're God's target. And God's willing to show up and he's willing to work there. That's the business that he is in. So what happens in Acts 9? So Saul's on a business trip. You know, he goes to the leaders and he says, hey, I want to go stomp out some Christians. Can you give me something here to kind of give me the authority to? Um, so, you know, they bless that. So... He's going to go look for more Christians headed to Damascus. And God has a spiritual detour plan for him. And I want to ask you guys, have you ever had a spiritual detour in your life? Have you ever been in a position when you were headed towards a direction that you feel is right? That you feel that this is what I need to do, right? And then God just decides that he takes it upon himself just to knock you right on your butt? 
Because I'll be honest, it's happened to me more times than I probably want to admit. One time came to mind when I was preparing this talk, and it was a time that um, I had a friend of mine, and you know he sinned against me, and it was a close friend. We all know that you know when a close friend hurts you, it hurts bad. You know, and I was hurt and I was upset, and I decided that I was you know I was I was going to give it to him, but I was going to give it to him in a spiritual manner. Okay, like I was going to, you know, I was, I was basically going to politely point out that he's not a good Christian, that he's a horrible person. I was going to point out the error of his ways, and I was going to remove the speck from his eye. And I remember I was getting ready to, I was on the road, you know, and I was planning to confront him, and I knew what I, I wanted to do and what I was going to do. But then I heard a voice, and it wasn't audible, but it was clear. And I believe it was the voice of God. And, and what that voice told me was, you've done worse to me. And you know what? That's fine. You've done worse to me. You've done worse to other people. You know, so why are you so quick to serve him justice when you yourself always desire mercy? And I remember on the spot, I was convicted. And I thought, you know what? I have messed up a lot. And I have sinned against my friends and I've hurt them. And how would I have wanted them to treat me? And then I decided that I was going to mimic that to, to what I was going to do to him. And I, was, and I was wrong. And I'm very, very thankful that God decided to get in my way. So Saul's on the road, right? He says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? See, there's a couple things about this passage that I want to point out, the things that I just really, really like. Um, the first thing I like is if you look at how fast that confession from Saul came out, you know, he says, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. The next one, this is, dude, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? That is probably one of, like, that is a miraculous turnaround time. Um, you know, you got this man who's like a fire-breathing killer, and the guy folds like a cheap suit, just like there, then and there. No argument, not a lot of dialogue. He says, you know, who are you? I'm Jesus. Lord, what do you want me to do? You know? And I believe that when God speaks in someone's heart and he speaks to them directly and gets their attention, that's all that needs to happen. At that point, what needs to happen will happen quickly. And the second thing that I love is that Christ tells him, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, that's one of those things. I know it's not a common saying now. <clears throat> not a lot of us refer to goats. Um, I didn't know what goads meant, but this is what it does mean. It was a tool that when they used the plow, they would use it to correct the oxen. You know, uh, it had like a little metal spike on it, and it would kind of poke or prick at them when they were going the wrong direction or not moving at all. So it was something that they were doing to basically control the direction that they wanted. Of, if they weren't going anywhere, if they're going in the wrong direction, it's how you got their attention to move them. Okay? So I like that because what does it mean? that he was kicking against the goads. What it does is it reaffirms what I was already saying. This was not the first interaction between Saul and Christ. See, because God had been working in the circumstances of Saul from way before that. But Saul was kicking. You know, he was kicking. He was trying to resist. So really quick, we all just be thankful for a God that doesn't give up when we kick against him. Because I think that there's been times in our life where God is pricking at us. And we're kicking back. And we might not want to have anything to do with what he's trying to tell us. But he doesn't give up. He keeps going. You know, and with Saul, these were small little pricks. And I was trying to figure out. Um, I was trying to figure out. Because it doesn't say in the Bible necessarily what they were. So I was trying to, you know, use what I knew about Saul to figure out what, what could have been. You know, what did God necessarily meant by that? What could have been happening? The first thing that I was thinking about was Saul was very well taught. Okay? He was, you know, he was a leader uh, in the synagogues. 
He probably knew all of the, prof- the prophecies about the Messiah. So I wonder if part of it was inside Saul's, you know, looking at Christ's resume. And he's saying, you know what, this guy kind of, he meets a lot of these things. You know, he was born in the right spot, right time. He's got the power to heal, perform miracles. Don't you think that must have pricked at his heart a little bit? It must have, right? Okay, well, you know, how about this verse here, right? Then the word of God spread, and the number, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The religious priests even? Even they were converting? Do you think that might have pricked a little bit at Saul's heart? I'm sure it must have. You know? Well, how about this? How about the acts of the Holy Spirit that were occurring? You know, these things, were, they were not explainable. They were miraculous. Pentecost, you got the disciples, all of them speaking in completely different languages. You've got St. Peter who just, you know, just denied Christ three times to peasants. And now he's standing giving this fiery sermon and he converts 3,000 people. You know, the church was continuing to grow more rapidly than ever, even though he himself was doing everything that he could to stop it. You don't think that could have been pricking at his heart? I think it could have. How about the martyrdom of St. Stephen? You know, how about right before he fell asleep, or really right before he died, he yelled, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And you've got this guy, Saul, who's who's just fueled by hatred and anger. And he's looking at this guy while he's being killed. He's saying, this is a, that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I can imagine just rehearsing that in his mind again and again and again every single night. How does someone have that level of forgiveness in them? And lastly, the thing that just kind of, I was, I was just thinking about, how about all the lives of the Christians that he came into contact with? Keep in mind, you know, at this point, Saul was picking him up and throwing him into jail. That was his gig every day. He'd go out there, he'd try to collect them and incarcerate them. And I can imagine Saul telling these guys, renounce your faith, curse Jesus. I will let you go, return to the true faith. And I can imagine these people that he's trying to arrest and try to put away, I can imagine them just basically saying, look, I can't, I can't. You know, no matter what he did, no matter what he threatened them with, the church was continuing to grow. And every person he threw into jail, you know, he'd want them to curse, he'd want them to reject, but instead, he'd hear miraculous stories. I can imagine throwing somebody into jail, being like, dude, you need to renounce Jesus. And he says, I can't. I was blind and now I see. How do I, you know, another person say, well, I was lame, but now I can walk. You know, the people throwing this in, but you know what? You know, I was possessed. I had evil, evil spirits and Jesus exercised the spirits from me. The disciples healed me. You know, I can imagine one of the guys saying, you know, it was the weirdest thing. We were out in this field and there was no food anywhere and we were hungry. And Christ fed all of us, 5,000 men in our families with five loaves and two fish. You know, and I, I can just guarantee that every single one of these stories that was shared with Saul while he was persecuting was a prick at his heart. You know, Christ trying to be like, dude, what you're doing is wrong. And the same God that was pricking that heart 2,000 years ago is the same God that's pricking our heart today. The same way he's working inside of us. The same way that he's pointing stuff out to us. The same way he's trying to get our attention again and again and again. And then I have this thought because you know what? The church is never short on persecution. And I wonder, do you think that the early church then, do you think that they were praying for him? You know, we hear about these fiery prayer meetings that they were having. You know, I think we heard about one last week. You know, and and we pray that they weren't, praying for like the death of their enemies and those persecuting, they're praying for boldness. You know, and I wonder, were they praying that, you know what, God, can you even change a heart like Saul's? You know, this is a desperate situation and we need you to intercede. You know, because they were clearly all terrified of him. And I believe that they were praying, I would believe that they were, that they were praying that there could be a conversion. And I believe that this conversion might have come to their faithful prayers. And it gives me hope. And I wonder, you know what, the church right now, we're not pointing to persecution. We know there are people that are persecuting us. We might not be feeling it here, but we feel it back in, back in Egypt at home. I wonder, what's our stance on it? You know, do we pray that something bad happens to all of them and that we take, you know, we get what's right and this and that and all this other stuff and that God will just come and save us? Or are we praying that God will 
save them. Maybe there could be a conversion there. And I'll be honest with you, I hear about a lot of conversions going on out there. A lot of Muslims becoming Christian. It's kind of like, you know, this underground movement and stuff. But that's what we should be praying for. Because that's where the testimony is. And it gives me hope. You know, it gives me hope because I believe that we are all praying for people. Not just our enemies. I guarantee that we have loved ones that we've been praying for for years. And there's loved ones that we're praying for. We say, you know what, dude, I'm even done praying. Like, I'm just, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Because we're not seeing a lot happen in their lives. And it seems like our prayers are doing absolutely nothing. And in some cases, it seems like, you know, this person's even getting further and further away. And it can get discouraging. But I'm going to tell you, we need to keep faith. We need to keep faith. And, I, and we have no idea what's really going on. And we have no idea what God is up to. Because repentance might only be right around the corner. Because as we see in Saul's conversion here, it only took a moment. One moment forever changed the trajectory of his life. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I was hearing this sermon. It was talking about um, in the, when the nation of Israel is taken over uh, Jericho. And it says, you know, how many times did they have to circle the wall? Seven times, right? They said, can you imagine if like on the sixth time they said, this isn't working? Like on the sixth time they said, you know, I'm done with it. Like we've done this. We've been out here. We do it again and again and again. Not a single rock is like falling out of place. I'm going home. We can't because we never know what's right around that corner. And I'll be honest, God never disappoints. He never disappoints. And I wanted to end, it's kind of a short talk today because I couldn't fit it all into one, so I'm going to break it into two. Um, I wanted to end with verse six. You know, and this was, Lord, what do you want me to do? Saul's response when Christ showed up to him. What do you want me to do? God brought this prideful, angry murderer down to his knees and brought him into complete submission. Complete submission. And I'll be honest, if he could do that with Saul, it gives me faith that he can do it with anyone. Anyone at all. And if there's anyone in our life that we feel is outside the reach of God, even if the person's me, even if the person's you, because I have to be honest, I don't think every single one of us might have actually said that to Christ. You know, I think it's easy sometimes we can say, yeah, you know, my buddy or this coworker or this friend or this family member, you know, they really need to be in complete submission to Christ. But sometimes we'll be completely overlooking that we ourselves are not in complete submission to Christ. But I want you to remember a few things. Maybe we never told God that. Um, Maybe you haven't had your two meeting on the road yet. But whether it's you or if it's someone you know, there's two important aspects. First of all, this is God's business. This is what he came for. He came for the lost. And if I look at the track record, he's really good at it. When God shows up in a situation, when he shows up in somebody's life, there's always transformation on the other side of it. He's really, really good at it. And the second thing is, if you think someone's too far off or too far gone, and I have people in my life that I, I've, I've just written them off. I said, it's just never going to happen. You know, like this heart is too hard for God to penetrate. Then I have to remember something. Wasn't he able to turn to change my heart? You know, I remember how my heart was before. You know, and if he could even get into my heart, I don't think there's a heart he can't get into. You know, so today I just want us to focus on the fact that we have a good, loving God. Not just a good, loving God up there, but he comes down and he chases us. He chases us down. He wants to come into a relationship with us. He wants to give us transformation. And he does not want to leave us the way that we are. So that being said, that was the first part of God's interaction with Saul. And then God willing, the next time we have this meeting... We are going to talk a little bit more about what happened after he got Saul's attention. So I hope, God willing, we'll be back for next time. Personally, I enjoy this meeting. Not just
just when I'm giving it, but also when, uh, when I'm attending it. I would love to see this meeting grow. I would love to see it in a way where I know it has to grow organically. So just invite people to stay. Because I think that good things happen when we get together and we, we center ourselves in the word of God for the week to come. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Him and one God, Amen. Dear Lord, we, we come before you today, Lord, and we thank you for a God who just pursues us, Lord. And, and Lord, there's so many things that when we look at the life of Saul, there's so many things for you just to be disgusted with and to hate and to almost want to just kind of just get rid of them. It, it sounds like it might have even been an easier solution, Lord. But you look so deep inside of us, Lord. Even though everything looks wicked and corrupt, you will find the good in us. And not only when you find the good in us, you will build on that. You will make us useful to you, Lord. You will grant us just happiness and satisfaction, Lord. You will just, it just turns everything upside down. Now, Lord, I'll be the first one to tell you, Lord, that I am that St. Peter that gets out of the boat. Where, Lord, I'll be looking dead at you and I'll say, you know what? I want miraculous things. But once I get out of the boat, I sure get distracted. I get distracted with the waves, whether it be work, life family, friends, whatever it is, Lord, and I, I confess to you that I give you what's left over. But Lord, I ask that you just, not only me, Lord, but all of us in this room, Lord, that you give us just a new set of eyes, Lord, just to, to look directly at you, Lord, that you become the primary focus, that you be the person that we're pursuing, Lord, because we know, Lord, that when we're pursuing you, everything else falls into place. I ask that you just have mercy on this church, Lord, that you build this church, you put your hand on this church, Lord, and that you let it grow the same way that the early church grew in the book of Acts. And Lord, we know that you are willing, and we ask that you just allow us to put our hand in your hand, Lord, that we get to work as well. Because we know it's not going to happen with us just sitting here and doing what we do, Lord. But we got to get out, and we have to pursue you and pursue others. And I ask this in your holy, precious Son's name, in the sessions of your holy Virgin Mother, Day of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. John's Lord, that all saints and tears. Here's some prayer, thankfully, one voice saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.